I'm going to show you how to use REST in Orchestrator. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Watchers from Bavork. If this is your first time here and you want to learn about automating, programming, and monitoring in VMware environments, you're in the right place. This is part 10 in a 10 part video series in which we're exploring how to make REST API calls. Here in part 10, we're going to be looking specifically at Orchestrator. In all of the preceding videos in part 10, we've been working with workflows that are pre-supplied by the REST plugin in Orchestrator. Uh, for example, at the tail end of the last video, we briefly mentioned invoke a dynamic REST operation. Uh, in the videos preceding that, we were working with all sorts of different configuration workflows. Uh, there's even more workflows that I didn't go into, but I think you can figure out basically what the rest of these do. But while these pre-supplied workflows are very useful in helping you to rapidly start making those REST operation calls that you want to make, sometimes you want to have complete control over exactly what's happening each step of the way. So what I would encourage you to do, we'll do a little bit of this in this particular video, but what I would encourage you to do if you want to have complete control is to start examining how these workflows actually work. For example, we used add a REST host and that made things easy, but did you know, you probably did, but did you know that if you go to the schema, you can see exactly how this is implemented, including uh, ultimately this workflow gets to this schema element where it does the bulk of the work. I'll leave it to you to take a look at the other parts here, but let's look at the code in this scriptable task titled add a REST host. We simply select that schema element, maybe resize the screen a bit here. Under add a REST host, that's that scriptable task, we can go to its scripting tab. And as you can see here, we can read all of the code that's involved in doing this task called adding a REST host. So loads of sample code that you can look at and you can pattern your custom code after. Um, let's take a quick look at add a REST operation. If we go to add a REST operation, it has just this single scriptable task. If we look at the code for that, uh, you can see that the code here is actually quite straightforward. So it looks like uh, we've got a comment on line number one. I'll leave it to you to study that one in depth. But line number two, notice it defines a variable called op. I'm going to guess that stands for operation. That's our variable that we're going to use to store the rest operation that we're adding. Now, notice in line number two that that variable called op is a new object of type rest operation. So this here is a constructor method. So um, constructor methods, if you're, if you're not an object-oriented programming person, in the world of object-oriented programming, objects have methods. Those are like functions that we can call to do something to an object. A constructor method like this one is used to actually instantiate a new object. Instantiate is just a fancy word here for create a new object. We're creating a new REST operation object, and uh, we're going to give it a name. Now you are perhaps asking yourself, how do I know what the definition of that REST operation object is? Um, if I knew the definition, then I would know all the properties associated with that object. And additionally, I would know all the methods associated with that REST operation object. So how do you know what the definition is for this type of object? You're going to see other types of objects. Anytime you see uh, some variable equals some new object and you see a constructor, I'm going to show you in a few moments how to go look up the definition of that object. But let's just assume for right now you've read through that documentation I'm about to show you and we'll take a look at the rest of this code here. So op, that's the variable that we just defined in line number two. Op is holding a rest operation object. If we say things like op dot something, then the thing after the op dot is either a property or a method. Uh, for example, here, uh, op in line number four, op dot URL template. Let me hide that tool tip. So looking at line number four, op dot URL template equals something is setting the 
property called URL template to some value in this newly instantiated object stored in the variable called op. Now, this is a little bit uh, contradictory sounding, but op.method is also a property. Um, I don't want to get all caught up in that, but just know from here on out, if you see some variable like op followed by a dot followed by some word and there's no parentheses immediately after that, when there's no parentheses after that, that's a property. On the other hand, if you see something like op dot send parentheses, that's a method. So again, looking at this code here and just sort of looking at a pseudo code, not understanding this entirely, it looks like it's creating a new variable in line two to hold our rest operation object. Uh, it's in line number three, it's specifying a property called method and setting it to some string value up here. Not quite certain what this method is just yet, but we'll look that up in the documentation here shortly. Line three is giving us the, the endpoint URL that this operation is going to perform. Op.default content types uh, is going to say something like um, this operation is going to send in a request body that's in application slash JSON format. Uh, line number six is just a, a logging statement. Um, if you log op, that's going to show all the object properties in the log. Then in line number eight, we're doing the same thing, but this time it's for the host. But crucially here, notice that line number nine says, let's go to our REST server host, which is in the variable called host, and let's add an operation to it. And what operation? Well, the operation that we just defined in the variable called op. And then if you call REST host manager .update host, that updates the REST server itself. Now again, to understand all this information here, it definitely helps to have a background in object-oriented programming. So if you don't know object-oriented programming, uh, and hopefully I haven't, but if I've thoroughly confused you, go uh, on the web and search for object-oriented programming tutorial and learn a bit about that. But assuming you are familiar with object-oriented programming and assuming I haven't thoroughly botched my description of this code here, let me show you in Orchestrator how you can go find out things like what is the definition of this object called a REST operation? Or for that matter, what is the definition of this uh, object here called a REST host manager? Well, to answer exciting questions like that, what you're going to do is go to something called the, it's hiding down here. There we go, the API Explorer. In the API Explorer, we have documentation for all the objects that Orchestrator and its plugins have defined, including, as I'm sure you've already guessed, here in this section of the documentation, we can find out information about every single object type that's defined by the REST plugin in Orchestrator. So let's go ahead and expand here, uh, and let's go look at the objects that it defines. Um, this is the uh, section where it's going to, to define the uh, rest operation object that we just saw. I think there was also rest host manager in the code that we just saw. Um, but let's look at rest operation. So if we select rest operation, it tells you here, uh, using the word attributes, I really wish we'd use the word properties here. Um, I'm more accustomed to the word properties being used in the world of object oriented programming. For whatever reason here in orchestrator, we refer to the object's properties as attributes. Go figure. But uh, whatever you want to call it, these are the properties of a REST operation object. So you'll recall with the constructor method, we passed in a name and that name got stored in the, the property called dot name. Uh, we didn't pass in an ID. Uh, ID is another property that presumably is set automatically by this, uh, object. When you instantiate a new REST operation object, uh, presumably it's actually setting the ID. It's not a whole lot of description here of what it's doing, but that would be my guess. Now, we saw in the sample code that we're just looking at that there's a property called URL template, um, and that one pretty much made sense. That's just the tail end of the endpoint URL. Now, I got a little tongue-tied in talking about this property because uh, if I were ruling the world, I would never call a property method because call a property method would 
uh, confuse people when you're talking about a property as opposed to method. But uh, let's see if the description gives us perhaps a little bit more. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Now it makes sense. Um, when we said op dot method, the value was not an object oriented programming method. That's not what the word method meant there. What they were referring to was the HTTP method, like git or put or post or delete and so forth. Um, so again, if I ruled the world, I would rename this property instead of calling it method, which clearly caused confusion for me. I would have named this property uh, something more descriptive like HTTP method. Then I would have known right from the start. But that aside, uh, you can see here all of the different properties of a REST operation object. Beneath that, in the methods section, now here we're not talking about HTTP method. In this methods section, we're talking about the, the methods, the functions that are defined on this particular object. So this word methods here, it means methods in the object-oriented programming sense of the word. So there's a method that allows us to clone an object. So for example, if you call in our code, if you said op.clone parentheses, that would create a copy of the rest operation. You'd then have two objects. Now, in the case of the clone method, uh, it requires no parameters. If there were parameters, you would put those parameters in the parentheses. In this case, there are no parameters, but you still need the parentheses. Whenever you're typing code to invoke a method, you're going to say method name parentheses, and maybe there will be parameters in the parentheses, maybe there won't, but you, for it to be treated as a method, you have to use the parentheses. Uh, what else do we have? Let's, uh, I'm reading this for the first time in forever. I'm um, just trying to find something that I can understand just from the name. Oh my gosh, we have all these different, um, all these different methods. Come on, give me an easy one. Give me an easy one. Okay, I don't see any easy ones. So let's scroll back here. Um, create request. Well, I haven't looked at this code in ages or looked at the documentation, but let's just read it here on the fly. So what's going to happen if we say op.create request parentheses and maybe we need some parameters, maybe we don't. Well, before we figure out what this does, um, take a look, I'm pausing the video if you'd like, but take a look in this documentation for the create request method and see if you can determine whether or not we need to put something in the parentheses. All right, you already seen this. Uh, you hit pause for about three nanoseconds. Maybe you didn't even need to do that, but you saw that the parameter section says you're going to have to pass in these two pieces of information to call this method. So you'd say something like op.create request and then in parentheses uh, looks like uh, what's param. So params is uh, sounds like the um, path parameters or perhaps query parameters in your URL and content would be the body the specifically the request body. Again, I'm making this up on the fly. I used to know this uh, REST API plugin uh, much more intimately, but it's been a long time. So I'm doing what perhaps you're going to be doing. You're going to be reading this documentation and making hopefully heads or tails of what it's trying to tell you. But this is the process that I'll go through. So I'll read the names of the methods. I'm going to, if I want to call this method, I'm going to have to type it exactly as it's spelled here, including with capitalization. I'll read the description of what the method does. Not all API documentation is equally awesomely written. Uh, hopefully the description will tell you clearly what the method does. The parameter section will tell you what parameters you need to pass in with the parentheses. And the return section will tell you what the return value is when you call this particular method. So it looks like this one returns something called a request object. But what is a request object? Well, as you can see here, this is actually a hypertext link that we can click on to go find out what a request object is. Now, we could search for request object, uh, but that's probably going to show up a whole bunch of entries. Uh, we could click on request object. My hunch here is that even though they've abbreviated the name here, they're probably talking about this thing here called a REST request. This could be some other type of request defined in Orchestrator itself, but I suspect this is just an abbreviation for what's called a REST request. All right, so we could click on request to see what the definition is. 
I'm pretty certain they're talking about this REST request here, so let's just go over there. So when you call a method such as create request and it returns a request object, uh, this is what you're getting back. You're getting back an object that has, oh good, it uh, will give you the full URL that was used to make the REST operation and the content type. So that's useful information to have. But oh my goodness, here is a super useful method that that object has. Once you've got that request object, it has a method called execute. So if we did something in our code, if we said op.execute, parentheses, uh, no need for any parameters here. So op.execute, parentheses, will actually invoke the REST operation itself. Now, as you can see, we also have execute with credentials in case there's some sort of authentication that's necessary. And you can set up headers and you can do all sorts of different things with these different methods. But um, that's what this REST request object is about. Now, again, I've taken you through a fairly quick on the fly exploration of the documentation itself. Uh, again, I was looking at this documentation on the fly for the first time in ages. And ideally when I do demos like that, I like to have everything down pat and show you perfectly exactly what I'm trying to demonstrate. But I actually think it was quite useful in this case that you could see me stumble a little bit and see how I am going through the steps of using the API Explorer. Now you're probably already familiar with the API Explorer. You probably use it all the time, but if you are not familiar with the API Explorer, if you've not been using it, you need to learn how to use it. So start practicing with the API Explorer. All right, I think this is a good point to switch things up in the part 10 videos. So far in the part 10 videos, I've been showing you how you can have your orchestrator workflow behave as a REST client. And that's very, 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 very useful knowledge to learn and practice, practice, practice. But in the following videos in part 10, what we're going to be talking about is how you can use the REST server that's built into orchestrator. So if you have an external uh, piece of software such as ARIA Automation or vSphere or a third party product, um, I believe ServiceNow can do this. Or if you have a REST client like Postman, or if you write code in languages that support making REST client calls, in, in, in any of those cases, you can cr create or use some sort of external tool like those to call to Orchestrator's REST server API and ask it to do things. For example, through the Orchestrator REST API, you can tell Orchestrator to run a workflow. That's one of the numerous REST operations that we provide. Uh, other REST operations would allow you to do things such as look up the status of a workflow that you launched via the REST server API. Now the REST server API built into Orchestrator obviously lets you do things related to workflows, but it does much more than that. So join me in the following part 10 videos because we got a lot more to explore. Join me in the next video as we continue our exploration into REST and Orchestrator.